Hello and welcome back to the Only Aki's channel. Today we have an exclusive no holds barred sit down interview with Stuart Taylor. Now we requested for this interview to happen to give fans an opportunity to put their questions to our head coach. So I want to say a quick thank you to Stuart Taylor for agreeing to sit down with us. A few guarantees I want to meet you guys personally. Number one is that every question and answer that you've seen this video as as it was on the day, there have been no cuts to anything. We did have to make some cuts just for technical reasons, but I want to guarantee that no questions or answers were cut or altered in any way through the editing. I also want to make it clear that I have tried to keep it as uncut as possible, but as I said, that wasn't always possible for technical reasons. The second guarantee I want to make is that nobody knew what the questions were going into this interview, only myself and Brandon saw them previously. So Stuart Taylor, the media officer, anyone at the club were not aware of what was going to be asked before we went into it. I do also want to say a quick thank you to the fans who submitted their questions for this video. It is a long one, so I'll stop talking now. Hopefully you guys enjoy it. As always, any feedback you can give for this interview is welcome. And if you could share it with as many Aki's fans as you could, that would be a big help too. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. So when you first came into the club, we asked you at your press conference your style of play that you want to implement and you held your cards quite close to your chest. Now we've kind of had the season play out, what would you say are the main characteristics behind the Naki side that you're trying to What would you say they are? Um, from what I can see from the outside... Please don't say boring. <laughs> possession based. Yep. Um, I would say possession based playing out from the back, I would say the two main characteristics. What would you say they are? I would say that, um, you know, possession based, definitely. Um, you know, I think that it's important that we try and have as much possession in games so that our supporters are watching our team, our team playing football or their team playing football um, and trying to be creative, um, try to dominate games with the ball but also not come away for the fact that when we are at a possession that we go and press, we'd be on the front foot, we'd be aggressive, we run around uh, and we go and win the ball back as soon as we possibly can. Um, I think they're probably the key parts um, that, that I would say. The reason for keeping my cards close to my chest is that, you know, I do feel that we put a lot of work in at this football club and I don't want to just go and give out that information to, to other clubs willy-nilly. Um, and, and if anybody's going to come and scout us, then let them go and do their work. I'm not going to give out information for us going working hard on that. It's got nothing against the supporters. I would tell the supporters of them, hence the reason why mm. encouraging the meeting. Um, but uh, it's just about not giving information away. So that was my, my big reason for doing that when I first came in. And um, yeah, I, I think that, that we, we work very hard in, in, in doing what we're doing. Are we perfect at it? Absolutely not. Um, should we be perfect at it? Absolutely not. We're human beings. But I want to be seen as that we are trying. We are working hard. We put a lot of work in, um, in at training uh, to try and achieve being the best we possibly can. Uh, my job is that I want to make this club, this football club better. Um, you know, in possession and out of possession. I want to try and attract the best possible players we can get. And I want to make the players and the staff that we've got here better and also you know improve myself because that improves the football club as well and I, I will lean into specifics a little bit um mostly just about the formation so it seems like the 4-3-3 is one you've used you've implemented from the start and kept consistent for the majority of the season there has been changes obviously in that in certain games why did the four why is the 4-3-3 the better formation for you for, for those characteristics what do you see in it that's better than say other formations you could choose well listen i don't want to start going in totally into depth and becoming, or being seen as being a bore um, by going into huge um, detail and coaching points. But with the 4-3-3, it gives you an opportunity to go and dominate the game in terms of going passing the ball um, and giving overloads in certain areas of the pitch. I'm a big believer in having superior in numbers in key areas of the pitch. And the 4-3-3 basically gives you the best opportunity to give you superior in numbers and overloads in key areas of the pitch to go and get yourself building through the thirds and to create opportunities. So that's changed kind of more recently, especially in the last few games, to a 5-2-3. So why did you make that change? Was it just game dependent and then you've seen it being effective and then I've you've been consistent five, with two, it? Three. I've never played a 5-2-3. What we did was we played um, a 3-4-1-2 um, because when we first... So going back, I'll always look quite a few games in advance. Um, We've went from 4-3-3 to 4-2-3-1. At times we've actually played 
as the game evolves, we've went at four diamond four, uh, four diamond two. Um, we've went with Partick Thistle here. We went three four three. Um, then we went Partick. Uh, we went our both coming up. Um, I said about going a, a, a three five two in that game um, because of the type of game it was going to be. And then just of late with Partick Thistle all away, we went three four one two because of the state of the pitch. Mm -hmm. um, as much as I want to go and pass the ball and I stayed, said that to the players that I don't believe in lumping it um, because it doesn't give you any domination in the game in terms of how the structure and how the shape is and, and I also believe that uh, you know once you become unstuck at lumping where do you go after that um, you know so that's just my beliefs and what I think is going to be the best for the players here and what we've got and also for developing players coming through. I'm a big believer in, in developing younger players. And um, with doing that system and that style of play, you're going to develop players and it gives you the possibility to have success, but also with those individuals to be able to go and sell them on. And let's be honest, that's the way forward in football. And certainly it's, it's the identity of this football club. When I was here before, it's what we did. You know, we had great success in bringing through the younger ones of like James McCarthy, James McCarthy and Brian Easton. That continued on to your Grant Gillespie's and your Ali Crawford's and, and so on. So it, the proof's in the pudding that, you know, it's the right thing to go and do. Football evolves. Um, and um, so does tactics as well. But, um, yeah, that, that's that's the reason for, for that and the reason for changing um, formations and stuff throughout the throughout the season and the reasons of why we changed it. Sorry. Sorry, Pepesca's agent, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. That's Guardiola. <laughs> Hello, he's looking for a kit, he's looking for a media guy. Uh, Sorry. That's all right. So would you say then, going forward, even though you've changed it, that the 4-3-3 the three, three is the formation you're looking to build the team around then for the future going forward, that's the formation you're looking to attract players into to fit that? No. Is no, it, so that, it's, it's, I'm coming at this transfer window and, and I spoke to the staff before January about a possible um, change in formation um, that we can um, um, be flexible with um, and uh, we've got two formations that, that we've, one we've tinkered with um, another one that, that we use <clears throat> that we know that, that has given us joy, has given us success in terms of um, creating chances, dominating games. Um, but also, there's another formation that, that wouldn't be a million miles off that that can still allow us to go and play the style. The style is the most important thing for me. Um, formations can change. It's, it's the style and, and the identity of, you've got to have an identity. Um, if you don't have an identity, you'll get lost. Um, and um, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll be fluctuating between two different formations next season. But the recruitment's been set about before January. It's been set about um, having those two different formations in mind. Right. Um, so fairly recently, you've had the front three: Winter Moyo and Ryan Moyo as the centre. Fans, fans have kind of got the consensus that Ryan and Winter are less effective when they're played out wide. Given Ryan's, I would describe him more as a poacher, you want him in the box. And in winter, while he's performed well out on the left, is maybe less effective as well. Why do you see playing them out wide with Moyo through the centre more effective than, say, having Ryan or Moyo through the centre and then having, say, like a Smith or a Kennedy or a Redfern on the wings? Why would you rather the three strikers? Quite incredible how you say that because for the last, well, since Party Thistle, we've went with two strikers. We went through the middle, along with Moyo, and Chucky's been the ten. But they have they have dropped. No, they have dropped wide when and Ryan no, at times. Absolutely not, no. But there is movement within that. Um, there's movement and there's always flexibility in how we go and play. I think if you become static, you're easily picked up. And it goes back to me saying there about how the identity of how we go and play. <clears throat> there's got to be movement, there's got to be a lot of uh, a work ethic behind the lads um, and that's probably the reason why it might confuse some people that you might see certain players going into different areas of the pitch, that's because we go and work on things and we ask players to to to, to, to go into certain areas, to go and move people around, to, for instance, you know, on Saturday in the first half, 
Queen of the South, um, you know, the, the two teams sat off us. So we've got to try and move them. Um, and you find that a lot with Celtic and you go to Parkhead and Ibrox, a lot of teams sit back and try and do, you know, blocks defensively and be hard to break down. Um, teams have done that coming here with us. Um, so it's really important that we try and move teams and, and move defences and, and, as I say, superior in numbers and um, try and create overloads in certain areas of the pitch. And that's probably the reason why you'll probably see certain players moving in different areas. Earlier on in the season, yes, absolutely. We had Chucky out playing out wide right. Um, but Chucky, when you look at his goals, he gravitates as a centre forward. And I spoke to Chucky about this. He gravitates out in wider areas. And he likes to come in off the right and do his curly one and, and score goals from there. And when you actually look, Chucky scored majority of his goals in those areas of the pitch or coming from playing on the right, like he did in the first game against Queen of South down there, where he scored playing wide right. Um, so, you know, as much as somebody used to wear a number nine on their back and that must mean he's playing as a centre forward and, you know, football's changed from that and, and it's about getting it's about getting your, your better players on the football pitch and, and, and having them come into areas where they're, they're at their best. Um, Chucky does very well as a 10, he does very well as a striker, he does very well as a, as a lone striker, as a, as a pairing striker, he does very well as, on the right coming in. Um, and as we say, I don't want Chucky being a, a, a wide right winger, He's, he plays round the corner and, and a little pocket that's almost like a uh, a shadow striker dropping off in the little pockets to go and go on the ball without going into much detail. That's my thoughts behind it, and and it's clearly it's it's had its successes because he scored the majority of his goals from there. When we've went one 0 up in games, fans have criticised us for sitting back and not trying to then extend that lead, and that's then caused us to concede late and end up dropping points from winning positions. What would you say to that criticism? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with? it? Understand it. Um, understand the frustrations behind it. Um, it's very easy for me to sit around and say, I'm more frustrated than you, but it's not a competition. Mm -hmm. We're all frustrated. We all want Hamilton to win every single game. I'm no different. Um, I think in scenarios, um, the Morton game was just, it was just incredible to be added eight minutes on where I asked the question of why the eight minutes. He said, substitutions. We only made one sub. It was Popescu that came off who left the six-yard box and went off behind the goals. So there's no time there. You can turn around and say, oh, Maka took a little bit longer to go and take a throw in. Or Luke Matheson was only told once, listen, can we go quicker? But he got booked at that same time. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other foot, you know, you, you see teams coming here and slowing the game down from the first minute, is what I speak about. Our growth being one of the biggest ones, where from the first second in the game, no time waste. But our tactic is to go in high intensity right from the start. Their tactic is to slow us down because they won't be able to live with us fitness-wise, not just our growth, by the way, before the end gets put out. I'm just talking about teams in general. So that's part of our tactic. I speak to referees and I'm saying, can we rush the game on right from the start? We don't um, look to, to go and, and waste time. Um, I think what we try to do is we try to manage the game. Could we be better at that? Absolutely. Um, have we spoken about that? Definitely. Um, we ana analyse every single game and we speak about, um, you know, what could we do better than what we did in our previous game. And certainly after the Morton game, we spoke about um, our line for the goal could have been higher. It was higher previously in the match, um, but it was just with the goalkeeper coming up. It was an unexpectancy. Um, so we've learned from that. Um, and other parts of the game about trying to kind of slow it down at the right times, what Patrick Thistle were great at, um, our both are great at doing it. Most other teams do it and get away with it. For some reason, we seem to be punished for it. Um, but there are other times where conceding the late goals um, without picking out any in specifics. You know, there are times that we could outwith the United one, which was a, a wonder strike. Times we, we could do things better. Um, we could defend certain situations better. I don't just mean that as a back four or a back three. I mean it from the front. You know, we defend together and we score together. 
So I'm a big believer in not having a blame culture in terms of, you know, starting to point fingers and lay blame at other people. So we'll all take it together and we'll stick by each other together. I think that's a mentality that's really, really important. Um, just like centre backs can go and score goals at set pieces, you know, as much as you know, we talk about our strikers should be scoring goals. So um, yeah, late goals is something we need to work on. Absolutely, we need to get better at seeing games out. Um, you know, but um, take on board. I've definitely take on board and understand the frustrations. Definitely, we're exactly the same. Oh, you hope you'll forgive me for quoting yourself to yourself. No problem. No problem. Um, but early in the season, you stated that game management is always something to look at. It's something we're very poor at early in the season, and there's still areas we need to improve. Do you feel that your game management has improved over the course of the season, and how did you go about improving that? Or are there still areas that? Yes, I think I think our game management has got better. Do I think it's fantastic? No, um, I think it's got better um, in terms about how we go about it. Um, you know, I want to be, as I said to you before, a, a possession based team where go and go on the ball, go and pass it about and run down the clock that way. Um, as opposed to, you know, maybe maybe what you'll see some teams will do when the ball goes out for a throw in, don't collect the ball and, you know, wait for somebody to go and get the ball for you, or, you know, a sub's been made and the ball's went out, leave the ball where it is, let the sub get done. And then, oh, go and get the ball to go and take the goal kick. They're all things that are really, really cute and, and good experience. We have a younger side. Mm. The things that we don't really know about. And it's okay me saying, do this, do that. But players are going into games with thousands of things going through their heads. Um, and just that little thing, sometimes they might forget about it, which is fine. And that's all about experience. It's about me making sure that I remind and, and I always say, Consistency, consistent messages, little and often, trying to get the message across to them. And that's why I continuously turn around and say that there's going to be bumps along the road. You know, but it's, it's if I say the process, it's part of it. Um, and uh, sometimes you need to take a little bit, and I don't want to be flippant with this, mm. taking it off for the smooth and, and accepting that we are going to make mistakes. We're not perfect, we're nowhere near it, but we are trying our hardest. And we will continue to try our hardest and we'll continue to keep trying to do the right things and, and recognising why we're doing it and who we're doing it for. When you first run the club, you used the word progress and you've kind of continued to do that. So we've just came down for the Premiership for the last seven years, best part of a decade. What at that point, when you, when you joined, would you have seen as progress after just getting relegated? What is progress to you from that point? Progress is from the first day when I, when I came in. It's not from where the club were before, and because I'll never ever talk about other people, you know, what happened under other regimes, and that's, it kind of is none of my business, um, in, in, a, in a respectful way. But I have to come in from the day that I come in and start assessing. Um, and there was a lot of things that, for me, we needed to improve massively on. Like what, can you give us specifics on that? Like, I don't want to be disrespectful or, or anything like that towards players or anybody. Um, I think I think I might be coming across as being having a go at other people and I wouldn't want to do that in a professional, in a professional way. So if you don't mind, that's not for me to answer is probably the best thing. You're going to see that's okay. for other people to see what have we got better in. Um, and um, yeah, that's probably the best way, just in case it gets misconstrued and then I'm, I'm being seen having a go at someone else. Right, okay. Um, now the season kind of takes its toll, what would you say is progression from this point now? So you had your thoughts when the season started, now we're at this point now, sitting kind of mid-table, still a few games left. What is progression going forward from this point? Easy to turn around and say, be better at what we're doing right now. Um, but certainly I would, I would like to be going into next season um, with a good pre-season under our belt. Starting the season a lot fitter, a lot stronger, um, a lot more confident and um, a lot more of a belief about how we play. Um, more confident in how we play in terms of we know our movements and we know where we should be at certain areas. Uh, when certain people are on the ball, what certain movements should be, and out of possession to to be a lot better organised, um, and a lot, as I said, a lot fitter and a lot stronger, so that we can go and win the ball back quicker 
and better and more efficiently. And I think you spoke quite a lot about his mentality yeah. within the squad. What did you see when you first came in that made that such a key thing you wanted to focus on? Was the, was there something that you saw when you met the players when you did your first few training sessions that you thought you need to change that or improve that in any way? Um, again, being careful, and I don't mean that as a cop out. As you know, I'll answer any questions. Um, I just think mentality is a very, very important thing in any sport. You've got to be mentally strong, you know. But the mentality is also confidence. Um, you know, being as confident, and making players as confident as they possibly can, but giving them that belief of what they're able to do and what they're capable of doing and how good they are at doing it. Um, um, as I say, in, in any sport, uh, mental strength is huge. Um, having that ability to go to tough stadiums, to go and go on the ball, to be brave enough to go and go on the ball, even though you just gave it away six times before it, to go and go on the ball and, 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 and try and make something happen again. Um, after making a mistake, I speak about it all the time, no disappointments. Yep, we won't. everybody's going to make mistakes in there. And I always say the younger players more so, if you weren't going to make mistakes, you wouldn't be here. You'd be at Real Madrid or Barcelona. Go and go on the ball. If you make a mistake, it's how you recover from a mistake. You'll probably see it a lot where you'll see a player maybe making a bad pass or, 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 or something not so great happening on the pitch where I'll scream at them and I'll give them an applause and encourage them and encourage them to go and get on the ball again because you can't afford players to go go on the ball. Because then you're playing with ten men. And then somebody else makes a mistake and somebody gives them pelters and that's you down to nine men. So my job is to keep them as confident and, and believe in them as much as I possibly can. You need every single player when you're out on the football pitch, that's why I'm a big fan of keep 11 players on the pitch. Don't get sent off. As much as I want you to be aggressive and, and go and press and win the ball back and don't pull out of tackles, I need 11 players on the pitch. But when those 11 players are out on the pitch, I need them giving them their all. I need them running about, I need them going and being brave, getting on the ball and take responsibility of it and if you miss a chance, so what? Go again, you'll get another chance. If you miss another one, so what? You go again, you'll get another chance. Say to the white players, see if you can't get by the guy the first time. Try again. See if it takes 99 times. And you do it again, you don't get by him. It might be that hundredth time you get by him. One time you get the ball in the box and score off and you win one nil. That's why you need players to go again and go again. And I'll, I do make demands, and I probably am quite demanding on it, but I, I back them and you know, I back everybody at the football club and you know, I've got a belief that, that we can get success here and, and that's why you, you need players going out the football pitch and, and, and don't worry about making mistakes, get on it again and keep trying. Still a, few, a fair few players here that were here last season, obviously when we were in the Premiership, when we were down the bottom of the table, who kind of went into each game wanting not to lose, you know, did you find that coming now in the championship and we're expected to dominate and win games? Did you find that you had to help change that mentality from the players that were here previously and get them more comfortable and going into games thinking we're going to win it rather than we're not going to lose? Yeah, I think I think winning's a habit. So it's losing, you know, and and um, it's about changing habits. I spoke about changing the culture when I came on the first. But that culture in the dressing room. But it was really the culture at the football club as well. There was a lot of negativity at the football club before I came in. Um, and that's something that's really important for me, hence the reason why encouraging this meeting is that changing the culture, not just in the dressing room, at the football club, including the supporters, and getting everybody to realise we're all in it together. And I keep continuously saying it, that we're ambassadors of people at Hamilton. We're ambassadors of the area. Whether the players come from here, they come from Ireland or wherever, they're here to represent Hamilton. And we want, and we, okay, we will have bad days. As I say, we'll have bad days. Every day's a bad day in the office. Is it acceptable? I want to say no, it's not, because we want to do everything great every single time we're on the pitch, like the supporters want that as well. And that's why we do demand it all the time. That's why we work hard at training all the time. That's why we do what we do. But we need to get rid of the negativity. Um, and we need to try and be a little bit more positive and get the frustrations. Totally get it. I totally understand the frustrations. Um, sometimes you can be a little bit um, um, unfair, you know. I think going at the start with the my first game was Queen of the South down there and we won. 
Second game was Hearts, here against Hearts B, and we were winning the game, and then they had scored and had a shout of, you know, this is, I don't know if I can you say that. Yeah, absolutely, you can say that. Uh, well, this isn't shit, um, and, and this and that, and, you know, just a hurl of abuse. I'm thinking, I'm on the door, you know, but that, I don't, I don't let it affect me. Because um, what's really important is that I have a clear head, and it's very easy for me to switch off to things. Very easy, um, and focus on my job. But I do get the frustrations. I do fully understand the frustrations. But that's what I'm saying. Hey, for it to be so early on, where I'd won, you know, the first game and second game, you know, we won it. But I do get the frustrations of the negativity that's been here for quite a while. But we need to change that. We need to change it. I need to change it. Um, the players, the football club, the supporters, everybody that's involved with Hamilton. It's about being more positive, being more su supportive. Um, and I said when I came in at first, I will not ask for patience. I will not ask for that because I, I think that word's been worn out by managers over the years of, you know, and I do get people coming in and, and want a certain amount of time. Going, but what I do say is, I just need people to understand them. Understanding of, of, you know, what was going on beforehand and understanding of, what we need to do to get back to where we all want to be. I want this club to be in the SPL. I probably want this club to be in positions where they've never been before. You know, I like Neil done fantastic when he was here. Absolutely brilliant. Why can't we try and get back to that? Different squad of players. Club's in a different position. We don't have... Ronnie's not here um, anymore. And, you know, um, we're grateful for, for Colin stepping in. You know, I'm probably going off on a little bit of a different angle here where we had a good transfer window in January with Colin coming in. You know, we spent money and um, we brought in the players, good players that we brought in. But let's try and be more positive and, and more understanding of, OK, you know, we're in a league we don't want to be in. Um, and uh, we, we want to get back up there. But how do we get back up there? We get back there by sticking together. We get back there by hard work and we get back there by, by being positive and, and giving it everything we've got, but every day together. Talking about improving fan relations, do you feel that the club have done enough this season to warrant an improvement? Because if, if I can speak from a fan's perspective, support has been dwindling for a long time. A long, long time. You see it yourself in the ground, support's dwindling, season ticket prices are down, gate numbers are down and all that as well. And a lot of the time, or a lot of the fans sorry, that I speak to, a lot of them are here purely for the love of the club and loyalty to them. And even that's dwindling now. You get fans that were going to games longer than I've been alive, decades, who have turned away from the club recently. And it's a, it's a lack of interaction almost at every level. And that's kind of, that's kind of what fans have, are trying to improve or have tried to improve previously, you know. Very little interaction with the board, things like the club shop and just general interaction is, is poor and we as fans look at other clubs jealous you know we look at I hate to say it but we look at Motherwell and their interaction is unbelievable it's night and day Livingston are the same and we, we just feel that there's nothing fans want more than to love the club and not have gripes with the club I would love to sit there result good or bad and go right okay we'll go next week but there isn't anything really to look forward to for a lot of fans now. And as I said, the loyalty of the club that's keeping them here now is dwindling, as well as support. So do you think, do you feel that the club have done enough this season? I'm only going to ask you about this season, the season you've been in. They've done enough to warrant that. And what are your plans? Are there plans in place going forward to work on and improve okay. that? Okay. I do have an answer for your question, but can mm -hmm. I throw that back at you? Mm -hmm. What could the club do? more of or better with and what would the supporters want because when I came in at first my first question was and my first demand was I want to meet with the supporters I want to meet with the supporters that are not happy um, you know um, I've told you the exact scenario where I was in um, and the reason why I wanted that meeting and uh, I said can we get that and I spoke to a couple of you and straight away I'd ask for a meeting with yourself um, about a meeting and, and give you an exclusive every single week, once a week to come in and sit and talk with myself and build that relationship. Um, but that never happened. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was a disappointment. But I will always try and find another way of what can we do next. Um, 
So a big thing for me is to you to answer that question before I go any further into minds. What do the supporters want out of the football club? What can we do as a football club that's better? I've got my ideas of what I've tried to do since I came in as a football club. Um, I've spoken to Colin, I've spoken to Alan about doing different things and Colin told me what he's tried to do. So if you could give me what you would like, supporters would like, hence the reason why our first meeting, what can what can we do for you and and you know going forward? Um, well, kind of, if, you know, you look at other clubs at the moment, incentives to encourage more fans just through the door generally. So what, like? Gate days. So we had previously listed, the club had listed a, a season ticket, bring a friend deal, so you have a season okay. ticket, get an extra ticket. Okay. The game ended up getting cancelled, I think it was the Arbroath game, ended up getting cancelled because of Covid, and that that offer was never put back in place. Okay. Other clubs like say Wraith Rovers and the family, they've lowered their ticket price in the end of the season to £5 to encourage fans in, and that is... I know it was a Fife Derby they first introduced it, so it was going to be a large crowd anyway, but they've continued that and since then the Dunfermline end has been sold out nearly every single game. Not just this season, but previously when you've not been here, fans have went to the board with suggestions and it's fell on deaf ears. I know personally fans have went in with PowerPoint presentations. Okay. This is what I want improvement from okay. and nothing's happened. Okay. So fans are feeling at a point now where they're kind of like, is it a point? You know, is it a point in given the club effort and giving them suggestions to improve things when we've done it previously nothing's happened so that's kind of why i led the question of if the club are serious and yourself are serious about improving fan relations what can the club do so to make what it kind better? of points were you putting forward um so things we mentioned before was um speakers nights legend speakers nights to kind of encourage more football based events so when i was a kid growing up there was the open days i think every season and you would go in there was like a beat the goalie with hammy the hamster or whatever you used to you get to go into the the dressing room and see the player's shirt signed up if players would come down and speak to you and all that it's stuff like that brandon was part of the Aki's youth club previously whereas like you signed up every year you got like a goodie bag with your stuff and then you get discounted season tickets for adults and stuff like that okay. we pitched these ideas this season as well and what we were told was well the fans can run it it's not for a, not fans to run it's the club to incentivize fans to get back into the ground so those are the things that have been thrown out previously from myself and from other fans okay okay um excellent um, I'm all for new ideas, I'm all for, as I said to you before, trying to make the club better. I'm all for trying to get more supporters through. I've recognised that's one thing that we spoke about when I was here the last time, there were more supporters. Mm -hmm. um, um, there certainly was a lot more of positivity. Um, I understand frustrations we spoke about before, but the big thing about this meeting is that how can we kick this forward? How can we go forward with this? How can, how can we get back to where we want to go and be? Uh, where we want to go, sorry. Um, so I'll take that on board. I've spoken to Colin, I've had quite a few meetings with Colin and Alan about um, what we can do and, and um, Colin spoken about he's giving free tickets out to schools. Mm -hmm. um, which, lot, which we think is a good idea. And a lot of them have not been taken up. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he gave out, was it 200? 2000. 2000, 2000 tickets and I think 20. I, I, I think they counted. 50 to each school. Colin had, Colin had counted back the tickets that came through the gate and there's a very small percentage, mm -hmm. but that's something we need to still continue and keep going. It's not going to change overnight. It's like the football pitch. It's not going to change overnight. It's the, dare I say the process worthy? Well, it is something we all need to buy into and we all need to work hard. And do you know what you're saying that about? But it might have to be one where a supporter might need to go and try and lead it. We're a small club. Mm -hmm. You know, I always say, say this before and I hope it doesn't get taken as a negative, but I genuinely mean it. When you're at Hamilton, you do it with three jobs. You know, everybody mucks in, everybody helps each other, and that's why I'm coming to you and saying, can you muck in? Can you help out? Hence the reason why we're having this meeting. So, can you do something? Is there something that maybe somebody can take a little bit of um, time to go and, and put aside and say, right, okay, we'll deal with this, we'll try and do this or try and do that, or we'll maybe commit, and I get time's valuable for people. Mm -hmm. You know, even if people that don't work, it's family time. Um, and, 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 and I really fully appreciate any time that people put towards the club because it's time away from their family. Um, I spoke about, you know, going out to schools, you know, we, we spoke there about, about having an open day, um, you know, this Easter, um, about supporters can come into the football club, you know, the kids can come in, um, Colin does the fireworks thing, um, and endless other nights that I know that have been taking a little bit of a, 
Um, negativity. Um, I hear things about boxing nights, um, you know, Celtic Legends nights and um, other dinosaur events and stuff like that. But we've got to remember, that brings in money. Um, and I think from right and okay in saying that, um, I think one of those nights brought in more than a, a, a home gate. Um, you know, and, and that's what it comes down to is, if that one night's bringing in more money than a home gate, should we really be giving negativity towards it? Or should we be turning and saying, listen, thanks very much. That's great money towards the football club. Thank you. Can we have more of them? You know, we, we, you're talking about, you know, two clubs that came down last year was Hamilton and Kilmarnock. Mm -hmm. There's a huge difference in terms of the volume of support. Yep. You know, there's a huge difference in, in season tickets. There's a huge difference in many other factors when it comes down to pounds and pennies. Um, you know, so the, all these wee things do help and they do make a difference. Do you think that some of them could be maybe more football based? Because I don't think. Like, I, th I think that the pro. I think one of the problems that fans have, certainly I have personally with them, is these events are great and they bring in money. Yeah. You know, we've been we've been told that before. But to encourage football fans back into the doors, to encourage Aki's fans to go to these events to support the club yeah. and to know that the money goes directly to, say, your playing budget mm -hmm. or whatever, I think that would make a big difference as well, knowing that we're going to, let's just use an Aki speaking out as an example, we're going to an Aki speaking out and being told every bit of money you guys spend here is going to Stuart Taylor's playing budget. I think you would see a big, big upturn in fans going to events okay. such as that. Right, so the first meeting that we had, I said to you about having a supporters night, you can have one uh, at Christmas where you have players there, I will have the players and I'll have the staff turning up um, to go and support your cause. I spoke about having a, an Aki's Legends night, I would help to get um, players that I've worked with before to come to the nights and I spoke about having an end of the season play of the, play of the year award from the supporters, you can have them here. Um, and I spoke to Alan was there that night as well and and I fully encouraged it and Alan fully encouraged it but none of that's came through so again this is something here that maybe that it is going out to everybody by all means see if you want a supporters night for player of the year go and organise it I'll try my hardest to speak to not to speak to Colin but I'll try my hardest to make a night available mm -hmm. that suits everybody I don't control what goes on because I know this place is really busy for functions but if we can try and encourage something like that definitely we want that that's again that's building relationships with players and and, um, and supporters um, I remember last time I was here we went up to the, we won the league we went up to the, the bar mm -hmm. up there and we went to go and see the supporters that's what it's all about players love that Supporters love it, but that's that's having that togetherness, that camaraderie, where you're you're all in it together. Um, there is things, there's ideas I want to go and do here for next season that I know the club want to do as well. Um, I spoke to Colin about it. Colin's great. Colin's given me ideas. Alan's given us ideas. We've all sat around the table. We want to do it for next season. Um, maybe sometimes I may be better starting at the start of a season um, from the summer all the way through when schools start back, but. Please come forward with ideas. So this is maybe something that as a forum now, open up, throw your ideas in. We don't have every idea that's going, but certainly the clubs that, that, that I've been at that take some ideas from some of them and use them here, why not? Let's take five. So going back to talking about mentality and the team, can you understand the fans' frustration when we're told things about being priced out of players and then going to quote unquote bigger clubs. So if I can reference it directly to Popescu, because I feel like we'll be talking about him anyway later on. When you came out and said that we're interested in keeping him, but the reality is other teams will be after him. Aggies fans know that. We know we don't pay huge wages and we know that if someone come here, like a Bruce Anderson come here, does well, they're going to go to a team that pays more wages in a better position in the league, whatever. And it's suggested by fans that that's not a great mentality to showcase in the press. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that... Showcase what? So, say that saying in the press, you know, we want Pescu, but the reality is there are other teams that are going to be paying more wages that will be in for them as well. Is that perhaps admitting defeat before the battle's begun style thing? Or? Absolutely not, because it's just the truth. 
um, I'll never go and lie. Um, but what I did say, I, I said that um, there are going to be other clubs interested in him, which is a fact. Um, but what I said was that other teams might be able to offer more money than us. But I believe we're in the driving seat because Pops has came here and he's really enjoyed his football. He's really enjoyed his time here. And for people going, players going elsewhere for a little bit of silver coin doesn't guarantee happiness, doesn't guarantee that he's going to go and play in a team that he's going to be happy and enjoy going to his work every day and playing a team that's going to go and play football which suits him. I do feel as if we put, you know, Pops went in the shop window when he came here and understandably because he's a football player. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that he's enjoyed it which gives us probably that edge over other clubs that is he going to go somewhere else and Pops is a very intelligent man. A very intelligent man that knows exactly what he needs out of his football career. And, um, you know, maybe for that little bit of silver coin that he might get elsewhere, with Pops being as intelligent as he is, knows what he needs out of his career, knows what he wants out of his career, um, that uh, hopefully we'll have done enough to go and show the proof in the pudding is that, well, you know you enjoy it here, you've played really good football and, and you've done you've done excellent, you've got a good rapport with the supporters, you're well respected in the dressing room and you're highly respected from the staff and the people from the football club. So we're in a good position there and I think you can pick the bones out of the, the negativity and say, oh, you see other people can offer more money. But when you actually listen to the interview, I spoke more about the positives of we're on the front foot, we've had him in here, he knows he enjoys it and um, therefore that if he goes somewhere else he can be a little bit of a gamble. I think I described him signing on Twitter as what could be a marker for next season. He's a high quality player, obviously he's done well at Hearts and Harry Spill at St Mirren as well and I just said from the great partnership Bill O'Reilly and Easton when they've played together seems to get on with them off the pitch as well and obviously as you said good rapport so I think I described it online as it sets a marker down from the club that they're serious about progressing and a signing of Popescu's calibre kind of adds, adds to that as well. Um, in terms of transfers in general I suppose the big question is about a striker. It's one you've been asked this season, but if we can kind of rope back into it again, the question, a lot of questions from one's of fans was, why did we not sign one? We were told we were getting one in the summer before you arrived, and we were told we were getting one in January again. So why did that not transpire? Okay, I'll never um, admit what players were looking to go into in the transfer window, um, because what it just does is that it, um, it, it, it bursts the player that's playing or the players that are playing in that position for you at that moment in time. So whether it be a, a striker is because you've mentioned it or whether it be a centre-back because you mentioned it. If I go in and say I'm after a striker and a centre-back, then the players that are playing in that position will be like, it's not great for them um, if a striker or a centre-back because you spoke of those positions comes in then great, you know, and, and it gives them that motivation if they have to go and keep their place. Um, but for that not to go through, the players go, well, they want rid of me anyway. Well, that's not the case. You're looking to go and strengthen the position. We want to improve everything at the football club. Um, we want to improve all positions. Will that be making the players that we've got here at this moment in time better? Or bringing someone in to give them competition to make them better? Or bringing them better than what we've got? There's three different ways to look at it. Um, I think there was a lot of... Well, we're linked to a lot of strikers knowing those footers. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, when I came in at first, um, you know, I knew, obviously I knew Chucky from my time before and I know the qualities that Chucky's got, you know, a fantastic finisher. Um, and um, knew of David Moylan. Um, I don't think there's any, any doubt about, you know, the the links with Ollie Shaw because I was up at mm -hmm. um, Ross County with him. Um, and I think probably it's a good opportunity now to go and um, stop Chinese whispers. Yep. Um, where... I suppose, can we, can we set it up just for maybe anybody who doesn't know the, okay? the context yeah, of the yeah, situation? Of course, so of course, no problem. At Alkin Lake Talbot, results not going your way, fans made their way around to behind the, uh, the dugout mm -hmm. and it's rumoured that you told a fan you didn't sign Ollie Shaw because you didn't trust him. That's absolutely really disappointed with myself 
um, really angry with myself that I, that I actually came across and, and um, gave that time um, because of the way it transpired. I'm all for ask, answering questions, hence the reason why we're sitting here. I'm all, all for giving people a place. Now, that is so untrue, it's incredible. Um, firstly, I, I gave time through a game which was wrong. It was wrong to do that. Um, but I went across and I answered the question, the reason why we didn't get all the show done, my exact words were, trust me, we couldn't afford them. Right. That was my exact words. Now whether that's been misconstrued and a um, little bit, uh, um, I don't want to be rude here, but mm -hmm. maybe the chap had a drink in him, I don't know, but that's the exact words where, trust me, we couldn't afford them. I know Ali Shaw, and I know him very well, and I speak to him every time we play him. Lovely lad. Of course I trust him, how can I not trust him? So I can't do it about, I can't do it about what people go and say. And if somebody's a conversation with me, I can't do anything about if they go and change those words and go somewhere else with that. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. If somebody wants to go and manipulate it and make it sound more exciting or less exciting, or there's nothing I can do. My fault is that I went across and I had those words, um, and therefore it created into a, a whirlwind of negativity and, and basically, I would like to say lies, but it's not going to say that, it's just been misconstrued because I'll give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, but that's my exact words that I said to them. And what I meant by that was, and I don't need to go into too much detail, but the financial package, the whole package, from transfer fee to everything else, it, it, was, it was incredible, incredibly high. And actually at that, that point where I, I went stop just now, but the person continued on. I went stop just now, we don't need to know anymore, it's, can't do it. And it just went on and on and on and on and I thought, Incredible. So we just we there was no chance of us competing with anything near that. Mm, nowhere near it. I don't even need to elaborate on that. Nowhere near it. It was it was I spoke to the person and I went just stop just now, listen. Great kid, love lad. I love it, love a lad, brilliant, great to work with. Enjoy my time working with him at Ross County, but you know, it's more important that we keep us football club running. It's more important we have a football club at the end of Winilla. Um And um, yeah, good on Kamala. They've paid a lot of money and they've, they've signed a good player. <clears throat> so, um, but that's that's the end of that one. Right, okay. Well, we'll link back to transfers, but since we're talking about the Auckland Lake game, there's a few things probably to cover in there. Yeah, no problem. Um, so after the game, fans went down to the stadium in protest of the result, performances, and then the ownership of the club. There's another rumour going around that you exited the team bus early before arriving at the stadium well, to avoid that confrontation. Did I get kicked off? <laughs> uh, to avoid that confrontation with the fans. Right, okay. Could you clarify whether that's true and if and if it is, why and if it's not? Right, I'm not making a joke of that. I was basically, um, that's not true. I was never on the team bus. I never on the team bus down to the game. I went in my own car. Right. I went in my own car like I did go to Inverness, like I did go to Air United, and like I did go to Party Thistle. And like I did do, right. going to many away games, I'll take Monka. So you were ne that that was never on a bus, not even for a, a second. Didn't even go on to say to the lads anything before or after the game. I took my own car down, and I parked next to Chucky. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, after that, when the bus had arrived, players were seen giving it back to the fans who were giving it to the players for the performances. Is that something you were aware of? And nope. Nope, um, I was aware that there was bottles and certain things thrown at the kit van um, and I was aware of um, police coming down and dogs and stuff like that um, which, as I say, I really fully understand the frustrations but disappointed in, in the reactions. So, the re so speaking to the fans, one of the reasons that I think they went down to it was it's happened something like this similar previously under Brian Rice where we lost, um, I've tried to put the actual score in my head, I think it was 8-0 against Rangers at Ibrox and fans went down to the stadium afterwards and Brian Rice came out and spoke to them and gave them, I don't know how long it was, 40 minutes, whatever it was, half an hour and spoke to them about it and that was, I feel, what fans wanted again was uh, 
say you're not on the bus, that, that's fine, but if you were, was that something you'd entertain? Would you came over and spoke to the fans and gave them that time after, after the game at the stadium? Certainly my press conference was all about um, saying it wasn't good enough, it wasn't acceptable, we were disappointed. As much as we're aware it was a, a very, very difficult tie, um, let's be honest, I think Andy that was in the round didn't want that away tie. And I'd even say in the next round, they didn't want it. You know, nobody wanted to go down there um, um, for for the reasons of it of it being. And I wouldn't even say a banana skin because it is one of the the most difficult places to go. You know, hence you know for the, for the fact that you know where they are, what they are, and 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 the atmosphere it's going to be. Um, you know, going down with the the young side that we had. Um, you know, it was always going to be a tough, a tough tie. Should we, should we, did, did I expect, did I, did go in there to win it? Yes, I did go in to win it. Um, you know, when you look at the difference in levels, it's easy to turn and say, you should win it, but you're no given right. Um, but it's something that, it was a massive, massive learning curve for us. It was a massive realisation for us. And, and it certainly stamped a lot of importance about the fix, about about how the game um, unfolded. To move away from Oaken Lake into another incident that's happened this season in your unofficial first game at home against Kelly when we lost two 0 you came down to the dugout with thirty minutes left. Why did you do that? What was your thinking behind doing that? Why was that important for you to do? Because I, I wanted to know that um, I knew there was a there was a. a a losing kind of mentality from the seasons before. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to go down and let the lads know that I was basically going to be there with them and, and, and fight with them. And, and it wasn't a case of me sitting up there and, and the staff taking the game and me saying, I'm all right sitting up here, I'll let you deal with that. I'm not like that, I would never be like that. And um, I felt that just maybe me being on the sidelines might be able to go and help and, and, and for us not to concede any more goals um, and uh, try and stay within the game or try and get back into the game. So it was just a case of me going down and, and, and helping out. To link it back to transfers, we'll go back. Um, you were quoted at saying previously when you were here uh, playing and coaching that we had great experienced players like Neil and McLaughlin who helped out the young, the young players like McCarthy and MacArthur. It's about having the right uh, blend but bringing the right people into the football club is the most important thing. Do you feel we are closer to having that correct balance between young play young players and experienced pros, or is that something you'll be looking to target experienced pros in the future windows to correct that balance? Yeah, but also say more and in, in, in better young players, um, as well as more and better experienced players. Um, just bring them better than what we've got um, and make make what we've got better. Um, I think we've done that with Popescu and O'Reilly and Lawson. I think they've been fantastic signings. And I think that um, young Ellis coming in as well has been has been has been good. He's he, he has a project and he's, there's a lot of work there. But he's shown me bits and pieces and, and um um he'll be absolutely fine. Um so yeah, I think that I think the players we brought in in January have, have been good. And uh, do, you, do you feel we are closer to creating that balance? Are we on the right path? To yeah, I think we're on the right mm -hmm. pathway, definitely. Um, you know, we've, we've obviously got <clears throat> um, coming the end of the season is going to be another transfer window, um, and there's there's going to be other opportunities to, to to reassess the squad and, and see what we've got and see what we can improve. Just on the transfer window strategy, it's something you spoke about. We're looking forward to X windows. Can you clarify that a bit? What you mean by that? And can you expand on that maybe a little bit more, what you mean in terms of looking ahead to two or three windows in the future? Yeah, I always look two windows ahead. Um, so looking back away, going into January, we knew we were um, nearly done with Anne. Um, we'd done a lot of work there. Um, we knew we were nearly done with Ellis. We'd done a lot of work there. Um, and um, it was about other, other positions that we wanted to, you know, with targets. Uh, we thought we were done with another two, which um, we end up losing for, for different reasons. But, you know, it's important that, that, that you have a list of players there that you're after. And, you know, if, if you lose one, you've got another 
couple of options. We don't believe, I don't believe in just going after, right, there's someone we want to go and get, you know, go and get him. Oh no, he's went somewhere else for whatever reason, right, we've got nobody. That's why I speak, keep speaking about that strategy and making sure that we don't go in with a scattergun approach of just shoot everywhere and see what we can catch. But we also don't have the approach of let them find us. You know, we sit back and wait for the phone call. Those phone calls always come. The phone's non-stop. Um, but can we do our work throughout the season? You know, we're just not concentrating and training and preparing for games. It's about, right, OK, who is there out there that, that we can go and um, target? Who do we think that, you know, is doing somewhere else? Or maybe not doing somewhere else so great that we can bring them to our mm -hmm. place and make them better, um, bring them into our environment, and they might suit our player uh, style and play a lot better than where they are at this moment in time. So there's loads of different reasons. I've got a, a checklist of that I go through, making sure that every player we come to this football club, do they tick all the boxes, or do they t tick as many of the boxes as written with what we need ticked to bring them in, so that they hit the ground running. Well, we don't have time for, and we certainly can't afford any. Um, that it comes in that, 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 that doesn't do great and, and um, improve us. That's why we're very particular about who we go after and make sure that, that we do things right. So a, a strategy you could call it that the club have used previously is to almost wait and see who pops up in a window. Because you know, at the start of the window, not every player knows what's going to happen and something can a deal can pop up in the middle of a window. Is that something that you're trying to eradicate? You don't want to go down that route of something pops up and going... That could do, or you just want to have it more? To, just as I said to you, that's always going to happen anyway, but don't rely on it. Mm. Have your have your targets, have have that plan in place where January's window was all about, right, let's get a better balance to the squad. You know, I came here and oh, I needed a right back. Um, um, you know, we needed certain positions, okay? We needed certain positions um, that we needed to get in quickly. So um, obviously we made it um, Pops and, and Luke Matheson and, and um, we then looked at January's window of who do we need to target, right, okay, let's get the balance correct so we have people in positions and competition in places that, you know, it uh, motivates the players that are here at this moment in time and gives them that um, opportunity to go and fight for places. So um, the summer is a different strategy and a different plan, different ideas, but we knew that before January. Um, we're looking at the summer window and we're also looking at January's window as well just now. Something that we spoke a lot, a lot about on the podcast is the club not being prepared for the coming season. A lot of our win a lot of our business previously has been done last minute. It doesn't give the players a lot of time to gel into the team and to get kind of comfortable and it means that we're starting the season slower than other teams because we're still trying to find our best eleven. We're trying to find that. Is that something we're not going to expect to see from you? We won't well, early deals done and that, as I said before, I'll not speak about it before because I don't want to become across as being disrespectful. Um, as I said to you um, looking before January, I was looking at January in the summer's window. Um, there's people there that I've spoken to. There's people there that I'm interested in. There's there's people that we've already I've spoken to to an agent about a player back in December about this season, uh, this summer. Um, again, whether it comes off or not, we just have to wait and see. But all we can do is we can we can um, sow our seeds and you know and, and hope, sorry plant our seeds and hopefully you know we can reap them in, in the right times and and make sure that um, everything's in place where come that time can we do it straight straight away as soon as possible like we did we done Dan or we announced Dan a couple of hours after mm. midnight the next intention was to to do the other player um, at six o'clock in the morning for people waking up and seeing we've got another signing come in it didn't come off that happens um, and then we'd obviously done Ellis later on that day as well for a lift for the supporters to go into the Queen of South game with three new signings um, didn't work out that way. We get two new signings in, which we're over them in with. But sometimes, you know, you can do all your planning, and sometimes it's still late on that the the player decides to right. Okay, you're the right one he wants to go to because he's holding off for whatever reason, a little bit more money, or a, a move to a different league or a different country. Or you're not in control of everything, which I find difficult. But I would like to get things done and organised. And I think I, sh I think as a club we showed that in in January. Um, that we've done our business pretty early and we still left it for, for the other ones that we got Stephen later on and you know 
this summer's going to be no different. Every transfer window is exactly the same. Until they put pen to paper, you just never know. I wonder if you could give us maybe a bit more clarity on the budgeting situation with Aki's because it's expected from fans that we've not got the greatest budget in the league, you know, the likes of Kelly um, and at Dundee are going to be coming down with the looks of it, Cove, Cove coming up. When we came down, the understanding from fans of th is things like TV revenue, parachute payments, the government loan would have put us in a better situation than other clubs in the Championship. From your understanding, is that the case or is that...? I have no idea. Right. I have no idea. That's something that we need to be spoken to Alan and, and Colin about when it comes to, you know, how much comes in for TV revenue and, and parachute payments. I have no idea. When you came in before, I'm assuming they discussed the budget you were going to have available going forward. Did you think that that was enough to achieve what you wanted to do, especially like in the initial period? I think um, when it comes to that financial side, Alan deals with all that. Um, the club deal with all that. Um, um, so when it comes to actual finer details and, and pounds and pennies, um, that's that's something that I work with the club and we all work together. Um, but the actual details of the pounds and the pennies, I'm not the finance person. It's, it's something that I know that any player that I've put towards the club since I came in in January, well, sorry, since I've came in mm. and gone into January, it's been, yes, let's do it, yes, let's do it. Right, OK. So there's been no... Um, situation going into January of, oh, too much money, we're not doing that, or this, or that, or different things. I know I have an idea of, of the budget in, in terms of affordability, but most importantly, it's about who's right for the club. So I've not had any, any negativity about that in, in since I've come in. Right, OK. Um, it's obviously not just um, on the park signings you've made, you've brought in Salem back from staff, John Rankin, yep. obviously been a big one. Fantastic. That's not something that Aki's have done previously. You know, we've kind of stuck with the same people to work under the same managers. Obviously, we saw Boozy Lefties went to Hibs, George Cairns just stepped away from the dugout um, into his kind of head of youth role. Why was that such a big, important thing for you to bring your own people in and to bring somebody like John Rankin into the club? Why was that so important for you to get right? Um, it's, it's important that... Um, that when you go to a football club, that um, you know your your identity comes through, um, what you want to do um, comes through, and um, you know we won't go into you know as I said to you for people before mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, you know, I spoke to Boozy and we came to a decision. Um, Rax has been fantastic since he came in. You know, he brings the passion and the driving and enthusiasm and and um, you know the knowledge and and uh, very similar to myself in a, in a lot of ways that um, you know it's, it's those demands of making sure that everyone's done right and 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 it's that extra voice. It's the extra voice of voice of of giving the lads direction, but letting the lads know that we trust them. We're a hundred percent behind them. We're given everything we possibly can to make them better as individuals, um, as and as a team, and making sure that that, um, that that that's not just driven from one voice. It's driven from from you know me and ranks and and, and obviously Potsy being a goalie coach as well. Um, so ranks has been superb, absolutely brilliant. Um, and the lads have, have, uh, have taken to them like they have done with any sign that's come in the football club. The lads have been welcoming, it's a great dressing room and, 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 and uh, anybody that comes into the football club, they, they welcome them with open arms as they have done the ranks. There's been a few more people you've brought in, um, maybe fans wouldn't be aware of them all, you brought analysts in and all yeah. that as well, what, what can you tell us, can you expand on that a little bit more about who? So basically when I came in, um, um, near enough every staff was leaving. So I had to change the physio, right. who was leaving. Um, the sports therapist had left, and um, we just brought in a new sports scientist who was then leaving. Um, so just, just on that, sorry to interrupt, was that a case of, say that their contracts with the club were leaving, they had other opportunities, was it a case of a new start almost gives you a chance to bring your people? Or it was just coincidence that these people were leaving as you were? as you were joining? 
We were leaving as, as, as I was joining. Um, they put their notice in before right. I before I came to the club. Um, so their, their notice was being served, and and um, it, to be honest, it was something. It was extra work that I didn't need. Mm. You know, coming to a football club, there's there's loads of things you need to do. Um, I always try to put a positive on things, and I'm thinking, right, okay, well, it's a fresh start, and you know, get new people in and and get them to to realise that there's a certain way that we go and work at the football club. Um, and uh, you know the new people coming in, um, Esteban and the, the physical side of things. He's came from Spain, and he's, you know, um, it's almost no near enough very difficult to try and get a um, a reference on him. But having a good friend over in Cadiz, uh, Antonio Calderon that I worked with at Airdrie, <coughs> still to keep in touch with good friends. Uh, he actually knew people in at Cadiz and gave us a good reference on him. Very good physical, um, works in different ways, very demanding. And um, good knowledge, but also a good person. So I knew he would fit into and in well into what we were doing. But Alan had interviewed him, um, and, and Alan was really happy with him. I spoke to him a couple of times, and when he was when he was trying to kind of, you know, um, get the process of coming over. And uh, this man's been brilliant since he came in. The sports therapist comes in and works with under 18s as well. Um, Elliot, he's came from down south. And he's done great with the kids, but he's also done great with the first team as well because he helps out. And again, it's that togetherness at the football club with under you know the the, the academy and the first team work together. Um, and Aaron, who we brought in for the analyst, um, he was young, um, had work experience at, at, at Hibs, and he's really bought into everything that we're doing. You know, again, I went to the club and asked him for a lot of money to go and get certain analysis equipment that I've used at other clubs. Um, and Darren's really taken it to like a fish to water. He's been the hours he does is unbelievable. The amount of information that he's picked up in a short space of time, and the analysis work that um, that we do with the players is there's a lot of pre-match, a lot of post-match, a lot of individual stuff, and that comes down to to making them better t tactically as well as you know that mentality that we spoke about earlier on. So there's a lot of work that does gets done in the classroom, you know, about you know the identity that. That, that we have and we're trying to get better at, but also about you know going into games or pre-match, um, pre-match build up and also a post-match of what we could do better and what we did well and what we could do better at, um, from games. So Aaron's been fantastic. He's been he's been incredible at that and uh, he's doing great. And Rory in with the, the sports science side of things, um, where we stepped him up from being academy sports scientist and we brought in a new sports science for the academy. Um, Rudy's done great with that as well, and, and his strengths will be in the, the, the gym where, you know, again, I've asked the club to spend a lot of money by getting a gymnasium in and getting a building for it, but also getting the equipment in as well, which will help us and help our younger lads as well as our older lads uh, become bigger and stronger, and in some cases, leaner, lighter, and stronger. So it's, it's um, you know, there's a, there's a, a real um, good spirit amongst the staff and the players, and a good combination between them as well. and. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good place. So talking about the nature of the club, there was a rumour before you arrived that it wasn't the nicest place inside the club. It was a bit negative and I think it was described by fans as toxic, a toxic environment within the club. Is that something you, were you, were you aware of that rumour before you came in? Is that something you've experienced firsthand and have had to try and change or? What was it, what was the toxic about? What was it? Um, not so sure, obviously specifics, but um, staff maybe not getting along, players maybe not getting along with the staff, disconnect between the boardroom and, and the staff underneath. So I said, I can only speak about the time when I'm here. <clears throat> and um, the first thing I spoke about when I came in, um, before I set foot in the place, was about changing the culture. Um, and um, yeah, I've spoken about that enough, I'll be repeat myself. I spoke about changing the culture, but elaborating on that about changing the culture at the football club, mm -hmm. in the dressing room, you know, supporters, out on the pitch, training pitch, um, everything. And um, we are getting there, but you know, we, we still need to we still need to improve in a lot of areas. So we spoke off camera briefly about fans and how influential fans can be to players and games and probably more influential than fans can think they're being. Yeah. Um, can you expand on that and what you meant by that? Just as I said to you before about, you know, 
you know, um, we want fans to be supporters, you know, and support the lads. Um, you spoke about the mentality earlier on, and I say about the mentality is very important in any sport. Um, nobody wants to get shouted at. Nobody wants to get, you know, um, cursing and swearing and, and um, getting told all sorts of abusive things. It doesn't matter who it is, and I'll, and I'll take you back to a scenario where my cousin said to me one day, he said, oh, so, so and so in a nightclub, and I told him he was fucking shit. And I went, what do you do that for? What, what are you going to gain out of that? I says, what would you do if I came along and said to you now, the way you're loading those vans, what the fuck are you doing? That's fucking shit. I'd hit you. I went, oh, you'd hit me. I said, but you expect to shout, at, you know, and get away with it. I went, you have to get behind the lads, you have to support them. Most, the biggest thing a player wants is to do well. Do well for himself, for the team and the supporters. They don't want to go out and play bad. They don't want to go out and 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 be poorly and get taken off and you know and and that's the thing that yes we understand frustrations. You know we've all been younger and supported certain football clubs. Um, we've got a couple of lads that support Hamilton. Um, you know and, and and have done since they were younger. So you know the biggest thing they want to go and do is go out and do great. And they also want their teammates to do great. I don't see anything positive coming out of, you know, a player being slaughtered, you know, and, and humiliated and abused. Um, and I think it's really important that, you know, as much as I say they're human beings and they're going to have um, good, bad and indifferent days. Um, and I don't expect, you know, when players give the ball away or, you know, do something bad that the supporters are going to cheer their name. I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm not daft. Um, but it's just about, you know, how can we get a better relationship that helps get that more positive support back? Um, and, I, and I've said it, you know, before when I came in at first, try and come along and enjoy the day. You know, enjoy the day and, and, and I get there's a, I think I spoke to you about it before, it's probably right now somebody gave me the explanation that the cheapest form of therapy just now was to go to a football game and pay 15, 20 pound. Hurl absolutely abuse that you wouldn't get away with in the street, you'd be arrested for. And then walk away after that final whistle goes and go, right, on the way back up the road, that was great. Can we make that a better day? You know, we spoke about changing the music, you know, after goal celebrations. We spoke about changing the music when the players go onto the pitch. You know, we've got them changing the music at the end of games when we win to give it a little bit more of a, a more positive vibe and a, a cheerier atmosphere, atmosphere at the place. You know, we're doing that for certain reasons so supporters can recognise the difference that we are trying every, everything possible. We're trying everything, and can we get that rub back on getting behind the lads and, you know, seeing that lads are having a difficult day? Can we get, you know, a song going or something going to get behind them and maybe just, you know, marginal gains, giving them that little bit of 10%, 20% encouragement and might just give them that little bit more confidence to go and maybe get by their man or score a goal or be creative or whatever the case may be. Because we all recognise that supporters make a difference. Because when we go to Parkhead and Ibrox, we speak about silencing the crowds. Um, you know, we speak about going to bigger stadiums and turn the supporters, frustrate the supporters, and we're no different. Clubs, I know, come here and say, slow the game down and frustrate the supporters. The supporters will go on their backs and then that, that'll make our job easier. So supporters are massive when it comes to that, and they're, they're part of a tactic. So yes, you know, can can we have that little bit more um, positivity? But it's a two-way thing. I fully understand mm -hmm. that, and that's why I say to the lads, get a fast start. You know, is that a tackle? Is that a, is that a, you know a shot at goal? Is that a goal? Or is it is it maybe creating a couple of crosses into the box that gets the supporters? We give them something to go and 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 cheer and yep, the easy comeback is well. You know, sometimes there's not anything. Mm -hmm. You know, but it's a two-way thing. Well, um, that that was actually going to be my next point. Is obviously building a positive a positive player, a positive team on the park, that's your building block for kind of having a more positive atmosphere at the game because if the, if the football's poor, the atmosphere's going to be poor and the chance of bringing fans that are stay away or exciting new fans, get them on the ground is going to be slim if the football's poor. Look, we're trying. Um, and I've said that after really good performances, I've said that after good wins, that, you know, it's important that we enjoy these good moments, but recognising, you know, it's a journey we're on and there's going to be ups and downs and there's going to be times where we know we need to do better. 
Um, but it's recognising that, knowing that, OK, let's keep it positive, let's keep it going, let's keep getting behind the lads and let's keep giving the support or something that we can be, we can be happy about and can be positive about. And, and um, yeah, basically try and, give, try and keep the place as, as positive as possible we can. Hence the reason why they change their songs and, and different things like that. Are we correct in saying that you personally are on a one-year rolling contract? That kind of ac how Ak has done it previously. Is that is that true for yourself? Yes. Do you feel that with the work you've put in already, the second year is justified so far from the work you've done? Do you feel you've done enough for the club to give you that second year? What do you think? I would say yes. I said in the podcast that. I don't think it's fair at the moment to judge you on the team because you've only had the one window. I, I personally feel that in terms of judging managers, you need to give them two or three to get a chance to build their own side. But just a question that fans submitted about, do you personally feel that you've done enough to showcase a chance to, to stay here and keep building what you're trying to build? Yeah, well, I think, I think if you don't get progression, then you know, you ask why not. Are we better than what we were when we came in at first? Yes. Um, you know, you know what? Where, um, there's so many things that that I've got in my room that that um, a lot of people would agree with. Um, there's so many things that we're getting feedback off other people. You know, people that know the game and people that managers in other and cl other clubs in the league and uh, other leagues. And it's all good positive feedback. Um, I believe in critical friends. People are going to tell you the truth and where we need to improve on. And I agree with them. You know, it's something that I know that we need to go and get better in. So it's a work in progress, definitely. You mentioned previously when Aki's were getting spoke about uh, as a takeover. You mentioned previous, previously you'd had you had planned talks to speak with the board about that. Has there been any further update on that in terms of the takeover from your your side of things when speaking to speaking to the higher ups in that situation? Yeah, I spoke to them and uh, they said as soon as something happens, we'll let you know. Um, that's all I need to know. Um, my job is here to go and uh, improve the, the the football team and and um, you know try and progress players and. Uh, Try and win games. Have you been given an assurance or assurances that whether the club's sold or not, that you'll be given a budget suitable for you to go and achieve what you want to achieve? Maybe time back to what I spoke about previously. The, the club's sold, the people that are here can't tell you what's going to happen. Um, that's something that the new owners come in that you speak to them about. So I don't know anything, I can't answer something that I don't know is going to happen. And if the club isn't sold, um, do you expect the same courtesy to be given this year in terms of budget and um, you know, being able to go to, you said previously, being able to go to the, the board and say, this is the player I want, they've been able to happy work with that. Are you, do you have that same feeling that well, whether the club's sold or not, that will happen? I think Ronnie left the club before Christmas. We had the transfer window where Colin was in charge and we had, I think it was one player short of the record signings of the Hamilton Ackies in the January window. I think that shows that Colin's putting money in. And uh, and backing us as, as a as a as a management team, um, so I think the proof's in the pudding there. And in terms of players that are out of contract in the summer, you mentioned obviously Popescu. We spoke about a lot. Jamie Hamilton as well. Are we any further ahead in um, contract extension talks with likes of Jamie Hamilton? Any other players? We're further ahead yeah. with Jamie, um, but we're still waiting back for an answer. I don't think the club could do any more at this mm -hmm. moment in time, um, and we're actively speaking to his agent at this moment in time. Uh, in terms of pre-season, have you got a pre-season programme already in place that you're going to implement when the time comes? Yes. Can you tell us about what it is? About there'll, be, there'll be a huge amount of running. There'll be a huge amount of um, you know, ball work and, and, and making sure that um, lads will be fit this season. And, and I think that's one thing that, you know, when I came in at first, it was about getting fitness levels up. Um, so we'll be making sure that pre-season will be will be um, done in a in a manner where we'll, when we come into the season starting, as in the you know the first league game, that will be that will be certain that we're we'll ready to go and and uh, be fit enough to go and compete in games. Um, given the success of Daniel O'Reilly joining us, is the Irish market something you'll be looking to exploit more? Uh, we spoke to David Elibert, We interviewed David Elibert who had said that he tried to tout a few players to you himself, so is that an Irish market you're looking to Yeah, look I've, I've known the Irish market for years because I was over there. Um, but even when I was here before, um, you know, I'd, um, we'd brought over Irish players and uh, we ended up signing one. And obviously, 
um, James. But uh, yeah, Lions Market something that that um, that's a good market for us. Um, we were close to getting another one done, but it didn't go through. Um, but it's 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 when I have good contacts over there that I trust and um, they keep an eye on it for me, and then I'll have a wee look and, and see how they're doing. And, Dave Elibert has obviously I've been in contact with Davey quite a bit and uh, we throw names back and forward. So, yeah, Davey's a great lad and, and I trust him. Um, he's another one that, uh, that's over there for us and, and I trust him. Again, you know, somebody I'd like to bring back to the football club for one of these Aki's legend nights that, you know, that we're speaking about. And, um, you know, it's a successful time and, and Davey was a huge part of it. The signing of Kai Kennedy is seen by some as a strange decision, given we were told that we wouldn't sign players for the sake of it. Mm. Now, especially given his wage, it's going to be a lot of facilities out on loan from range, going to be a lot higher. It's unlikely we get him permanently next season. Do you feel that that signing could have halted the development of other wingers like Lewis Smith, Marley Redfern, even Kyle Monroe, who's out on loan now? Yeah. So, um, Kai Kennedy was an important one for us because young Marley had, I think, only played one game and before I'd come in, you know, in, uh, last season. Mm -hmm. I think I've, I've made it clear that I've, I've used Mali an awful lot this season for one reason, that that, um, that he's good enough, but also a second reason is that we didn't have any other option on that side. Um, so we needed someone to come in that could, that could, um, that could balance that for him. And Marley's injury came around with possibly an overuse. Um, you know, which which was which wasn't ideal because he's a he's a fantastic young player, uh, one that I like a lot and one that I think will do very well in the game. Um, so bringing bringing Kai in, who was nowhere near um, over and above what we pay, um, I'm fortunate enough that you know we got good relationships with people in the Rangers that that um, helped that go through. Um, and then um, it wasn't one I would never ever stunt the development of any of our younger players here at this football club because it's most important that we actually develop them and progress them. Um, but as we spoke about before, it's about the balance and it's about helping those younger players. And Kai would be one that would come in and help and he came in and, and, and started very well. Um, but then picked up an injury which he played through towards the end of it and um, then they end up He's pulled out and, and um, he's finding it difficult to come back from that injury. He's back at Rangers now getting treatment and we just need to wait and see how the next couple of days and, and maybe weeks unfold for him. But um, that was the reasons behind signing Kai that he would help out in options in that wider area on that side of things. And it's probably worked out to be the correct, si well, sorry, it has worked out to be the correct signing because Marley ended up getting injured. It just so happens now that Kai's picked up an injury as well. Which is unfortunate. And Kerr McEnroy was another one that we were linked with in the window, and it was kind of seen as wrapped up. That was the perception from fans of that deal was done. Is that true? And and if so, how how did it end up not happening? You know, you you, you can't stop anything about rumours. You can't do anything about it at all. Never once spoke to Kerr. Um, never once um, spoke to anybody that that, um, that is involved with Kerr. Um, and. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably the end of that one. But there's always going to be a rumour mill in football and there's always going to be names that are going to be thrown about. I think the only one that somebody had the nail on the head was with Dan once it had been released over an island. But I'll never ever, you know, uh, release anything until pen goes to, to paper and, and, and something's done because otherwise they're just going to get people's hopes up. Do you believe next season will be challenging for promotion? Is that your aim? I think we'll keep our targets close just now because it's a long season and I've always said that the league table is the most important bit at the end of the season and no matter how you start you'll always be putting you know players under pressure by saying you know we should be here by this point we should have so many points by this point and before you know it you're going to 10, 15, 20, 25 games into the season and people are turning and saying well you've no chance of this and you've no chance of that um, you know so what we're looking for is we're looking for progression on this season. What would your message be to stay away fans, fans that we spoke about earlier on that have decided not to come to games? What would your message be to them to give them an incentive to return? Come back, support your club. Um, the players need you, the staff need you, the club needs you. Um, it's, your, it's your local football club. 
come and support it with as much passion as you possibly can, with as much positivity as you possibly can. Um, if there's something that we can do to get you back, tell us what it is and um, give as much support as we possibly can because we're trying to do the best for the area, we're trying to do the best for the community and we're trying to look into different avenues of, of how we can be to be shown to be trying. Um, it's easy to it's easy for words, but you know, I'm I'm a big believer in, you know, actions and, and go and do it. Um, and um, yeah, so if there's anything that we can do, let us know. But come back, don't stay away. It's not doing the club any good. Um, come back and get behind the lads and, and and come here and try and enjoy the day. Now that the season's almost over, did you consider avoiding relegation as a positive and is that a step in the right direction? I got told on it before I came in, before at any end, before the ball had been kicked. You know, a lot of people were, were saying there might have been a double done. Um, I never once looked at that as being a possibility, um, as an option, as anything. It was all about, for me coming in, it was all about trying to get the place going again. Um, changing the cultures I spoke about, trying to get more positivity about the place, trying to get an education, trying to get about um, making the environment better, making the, the players better, making the staff better, um, and making it a, a, a more enjoyable place for, for everybody that comes to their work. About trying to build relationships with the supporters, getting back to that um, camaraderie, that togetherness, so we're all in it together and, and we're all here for each other. and. That's for me what it was when I came in at first of, of, of trying to rebuild the football club again. Uh, so 25 of the 32 games um, have been decided by a goal or by a draw. Do you feel like you could have adopted a more positive approach in those games that would have turned those drop points into wins? I think maybe at times people might have said they were maybe too positive. Um, we were trying to get forward too much. Um, some people could say that which I can understand what they're saying, but I'll always go out with the attitude of let's go and win every single game. I don't, don't sit back and try and, you know, um, soak up pressure and kill intensity in games. I'll not do that. I'd rather I'd rather go out fighting and, and, and go out and, and being positive and, and trying our hardest and to, to go and win a game of football. Uh, there is a section of support that don't feel you're the right person to take Aki's forward. Do you have a message for those fans that maybe feel that you're not the right man to get them maybe more on side? I'm actually quite happy with that rather than somebody wanting me to die a couple of weeks ago. Um, which So that's maybe an improvement. Um, as in, it's, football's full of opinions. Um, Apart from the die thing, I think mean, that's just a bit too far, especially when your nine year old son hears it and starts asking you questions. But football, as I said to you before, it's become the cheapest form of therapy. People are allowed their opinions, if they don't think that, that's fine. It's up to me to go and prove them wrong. Um, it's up to, to, to time to go, and, to go and try and change people that are willing to be changed. Some people, um, no matter who the manager is that comes into any football club, you know, we, we've seen it when, when um, to go and into Chelsea. There were some supporters who were just like, absolutely no chance he shouldn't be in. People with all their opinions. Um, so, um, yeah, just need to wait and see how things go. And certainly if it's down to hard work and, and doing the right things, then, you know, I'll never be questioned on that. When it comes to players that are a contract I mentioned previously, do you believe that we should be prioritising the money that would be used for giving contracts to players who may not feature as much and use that money instead of players that we know are going to make an impact. So rather than building the squad size, building a better team on the pitch of players that we're actually going to use. Yeah, well, you know, since I've come in, there's, there's, there's obviously as a manager you inherit, or a head coach you inherit a squad of players, um, no matter what club you go into. And it's about um, um, getting the best out of that. Um, and trying to make that better. Um, sometimes people come in and take players. Sometimes people come in and buy players. Sometimes you get offered, you know, a swap for players. Sometimes players want to leave, um, and sometimes players want to stay. They're enjoying it and and they feel that they're getting better and, and things like that. So there's many different options uh, that, that that go through um, for a manager or a head coach to go and deal with. Um, so I'm no different. Um, and um, you know it's about dealing with with uh, 
contract situations, when players are up, who you want to keep, who you can keep, who wants to stay. Um, and every transfer window, more so at the end of the season, that's when lads are up and, and that's when um, situations uh, arise that you have to speak to and try, and, and try and deal with. Some of the players that played with us in the Premiership have went out on loan this season. Um, and a few fans have questioned the level that they've went out on loan to. Given that they've played with us in the Premiership and may have featured with you at the start of the Championship, why was those loan deals given to the levels they were at? Was that just the teams that came in for them? Was that the kind of a plan to put them at, to that, at that level? Well, I want players to go at the highest level they possibly can. Um, and, um, you know, you try every level and to, to try and get, to get players out to go and play games, because it's real important that they go and play games for certain reasons. Some are different for experience to go and get games or some different for a, a, a case of, you know, to, to, to just get more games under their belt. Um, and, um, you know, it doesn't mean to say if players go out at a certain level, it's because only that level won sometimes. It's only what people have left on their budget or, or the position that people are looking for. So every, every scenario is totally different. Um, but we're always trying to get players out to the highest level I possibly can. Um, just to mention on time wasting in the games, as a tactic that we've been, that we've we've used, you know, you mentioned previous other teams using it, but we have used it as well. Do you agree that, that using that tactic has caused us to drop points? You know, added time getting out, you mentioned earlier on about added time getting out. Do you think that we're guilty of that as well? And that's why in some of the games have ended up drawing points, conceding late goals. I think as I said to you before, there's never been one moment I've said to, to lads going time list. I've spoken about managing the game. Um, as other clubs do, as every club does. Um, and I just think that uh, for whatever reason, you know, we seem to be punished for it. Like Saturday there, there was only was it four minutes or five minutes added on, where certain scenario was, was ridiculous. Um, but I do think that other managers and players do put other, you know, their officials under pressure when it comes to, to how they approach them and, and force that um, that uh, issue of added time, where maybe we can be maybe a little bit too nice with that and and overlook that. Um, but uh, no, never once have I turned around and said let's time waste. Uh, so we, you know, yeah, by all means, you know, um, managing the game properly. Do you think that the position the club are in currently, where we are sitting at the table and what's happened this season, would you say that level is acceptable for what you expected coming in, especially given the fact we just came in for the Premiership and a lot of the players you had in your squad had played in that Premiership? Do you think where we are currently is an acceptable level to be at? I think when you look at the difference with Kilmarnock and Hamilton, I think they kept the majority, if not all, their players from coming down uh, and um, you know added with lads that have experience of playing in the SPL. Um, I have no idea, the only one I do know that Ross Callahan left and there's someone who came to Ross County where I was. But I think there was quite a few others that had left to go down south, obviously the lad went to Hibs. So there was a lot of um, experience that had left the side in the summer. Um, but um, yeah, that's, you know, I came in as the transfer window was closing. You know, it's, as I said to you before, it was about me coming in and a building job. Um, and. Um, you know, if if we would have won the league this season, absolutely fantastic went up. Um, you know, that's that's a different thing that's not happened. So um, yeah, going into this window is really about important. You know, of, of making sure that we get the right players in, but starting pre-season properly and getting things done correctly.